Creek Church. Come on. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord together. Come on, can we worship our God today? We want to welcome Duncan and Dive All units. We want to welcome everyone watching online. Come on, can we welcome them this morning? Come on, we sing this together. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bad bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I and just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. We say, he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I make the master, I make the savior, because he healed my heart. To believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burning and bitterness You just can't keep it moving No, you're not welcome here, no From now till I walk the streets of gold together and it's all about trusting in God that we don't have to know everything we don't have to know everything but we can trust in him so let's believe that and declare it together as we sing blessed assurance Jesus is mine he's been my fourth man in the fire time <laughs> born of his spirit and washed in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough so we sing I trust 
I sought the Lord and he answered and he delivered me from fear. He sang that with confidence. So can we sing this with confidence that we sought the Lord? Come on, we sing. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard. And he answered, that's why I trust him. Come on, seek him this morning. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he 
through a cancer journey and I was terrified and I can tell you this morning I sought the Lord and he showed up and he answered so I don't know what you're here for this morning if it's healing for your body your marriage if it's sickness or disease seek him a thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name, come on, is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. Above anything and everything. All thrones and dominions. All
you are, for all that you've been and all that you're doing, God. We trust you with our lives and we thank you, knowing that our lives are in such good and faithful hands. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Good morning, Timber Creek. We are so glad to get to worship with you today. If you're new, thank you for choosing to spend part of your week here with us. Please fill out the Connect card located in the seat back pocket right in front of you. You can drop it in the giving buckets as they are passed or place it in one of the giving boxes in our lobbies. This is a great way for you to take your next step in getting connected or let us know how we can be praying for you. At this time, we are continuing in worship through our giving. We are so thankful for the faithful generosity of our church family. If you've never made giving into God's kingdom a priority in your monthly budget and finances, this is a great time to try putting God first. Maybe you're wondering where to start. We illustrate the giving journey with the giving ladder. Maybe you're moving from a potential giver to an emerging giver, emerging to consistent, moving from consistent to tithing or from tithing to extravagantly giving into God's kingdom. Take time to pray and ask God what next step He is asking you to take. You can give at TimberCreekChurch.com using our app, any of the giving boxes in our lobbies, or in the giving buckets as they're passed now. We are less than one month away from Dear Texas. Dear Texas is a week-long opportunity at all of our campuses to say thank you to our communities. We have serving opportunities for all ages, Monday through Friday, from 8.30 to noon, the week of July 22nd through 27th. This is such a special time every year that we spend giving back to our communities. Sign up today for the whole week or just a day. We can't wait to serve with you. Here at Timber Creek, we have so many ways to get connected to God and to others. Download our Timber Creek Church app to take notes on the Sunday sermon, access tools for prayer, Bible reading, Bible studies and devotions, and so much more. It's just a click away. You can search Timber Creek Church in your Apple or Google App Store to download. For more information on anything mentioned today, you can scan the QR code in the bottom right-hand corner of your worship guide. And once again, thanks for being with us this weekend. Hey, Timber Creek Church family, we're continuing on in our series on the Ten Commandments. In the meantime, I am actually uh, starting a uh, 30-day sabbatical where I'm taking time off. A few years ago, the the board uh, put into position a time for me during the summer to truly disconnect and rest. And here's what's crazy. It's almost like a little bit scary that, that every time I've stepped away, number one, I always come back ready and excited and locked in. But like the church grows and our team gets stronger and we also get to hear from other voices. And I love that we're growing. This church, the center is Jesus. The center can't ever be a pastor. And so I love this season because I'm able to step away and hear from God and see what God wants to do next at Timber Creek and in my own life and in my family's life. But then also we get to hear over the next few weeks the same series but through some of our own staff pastors. And today it is my thrill to be able to welcome into this edition of the Ten Commandments the campus pastor of Lufkin, Pastor Justin Lindsay. He is a friend. He is uh, not just biscuit because, I mean, he'll be your buddy. He will give you the shirt off his back. He's done it for me before. It was a little awkward driving around in the car like that. I digress. Everybody, I love his heart. I love his attitude. I love his growth that God is doing in him and through his family. So come on, Timber Creek, all locations. Give it up for the Lufkin campus pastor, Justin Lindsay. Good morning, or good midday. Um, 
uh, thank you guys for being here with us today. So I have the privilege as we continue to our series X, our series uh, going through uh, the Ten Commandments, and I have the responsibility of talking today and speaking on the Seventh Commandment. And the Seventh Commandment in Exodus, God says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. When we read it, I believe we more read it along the lines of, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's one of those topics that can be a little sensitive. And so before we get going this morning, if any parents due to the sensitivity of this topic uh, would like to check their kids in the kid works, we want to give you that opportunity. But when we're looking at this topic and we're talking about the commandments, this one specific, I would be willing to say that um, with a room this size and all of our campuses that are joining us, um, that this topic is going to translate and really hit home uh, differently to everybody and based off of age, based off of culture, and actually based off of life experiences. And so um, it's probably not the most common uh, topic that is discussed at the dinner table. Um, it's a lot easier for us as uh, parents to talk about honor thy father and mother kids. Um, let's try not to kill nobody this week, right? And uh, let's ease up on the lying and go ahead and quit looking at that pool down the road at Billy's house because you're not getting a pool anytime soon. But around the dinner table, um, I'd be willing to bet that this is a topic that probably should be discussed a little bit more. And so before we unpack what God, I know what God has for us today, um, just a little disclaimer. This is a topic that has directly affected me since childhood. Um, actions of others have affected me and actions of myself have, effect, have affected others. Um, I'm not here to throw my life on the screens behind you. That's not what this is about because um, my past is my past and um, because God is in my past, I am free. Um, I am not guilty. I don't have shame in my life. I am a living uh, a life full of grace and, 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 and mercy. And so uh, God has, me and God have dealt with the wrongs of my life, uh, good and bad. I mean, he is, uh, when I look behind uh, of what uh, my lo life looks like leading up to the day, I can see Jesus wrapped in the good and the bad. And so, but I do bring this message today with a very sensitive spirit. Um, not a place of judgment in any form or fashion but a place of healthy conviction and understanding of why God has this as a commandment, why God has, why God has put in guardrails around our sexuality, but also um, with an understanding, a sensitive understanding of just how the enemy has attacked this for so long. You know, the enemy has had 6,000 years to practice attacking mankind and so um, uh, in all of that, God still has a plan and a solution for freedom in anything and everything that we face. And so those are the three things I want to look at today. I want to look at what adultery is. I want to look at why God has called this to be one of the commandments. And then I also want to end, this, uh, end today with a solution. Like what's, what's a plan? God gives us a plan for everything. And so... Lord, I just come to you this morning as we begin to unpack your word, God, the message you have given me for your church, and God, I just pray that your spirit of peace, your spirit of grace be upon us. God, I just pray that through this message, that if it's just one person in the room, be willing to reach down and, and grab your hand of kindness, God, that leads us to repentance. God, I just pray that... Um, you open our minds and our hearts to what you want to transform in our life today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's look at real quick what adultery is. Um, adultery, when God's talking about it in Exodus, he's making a statement and he's talking to the action of adultery. And it says, at its minimum, adultery is sexual intercourse involving at least one married person. It is a sexual infraction to or by a married person. When we hear that definition, it's very easy for some of us to say, oh, well, I'm good. I've been married for 30, 40 plus years, and I've never, I've never had sexual relations with anyone but my wife. And that's amazing. 
Some of us may in this moment say, oh, that's uncomfortable for me because that actually speaks to my current situation. This is something that is directly affecting me, my household, or someone very close to me right now. And so God speaks to the action of this in Exodus. But along comes Jesus in the book of Matthew when he's on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's actually showing us that this is, actually applies to all of us. This is something that has affected and is affecting and can affect each and every one of us. He comes in and he levels the playing field, and he takes it from the action and he speaks to the heart. And in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, it says this. He says, you have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who's even looked at a woman or a man with lust has already committed adultery with them in their heart. And even seeing the action side of it from God, Jesus speaking to the heart. Some of us may say, yeah, I, you know, I know that's a commandment, but for today, like in today's society and where we're at as a culture, I don't know that that really applies. Um, and the enemy has, has led us to believe that. He has led us to believe if it feels good, then it must be good. And so that's for me. If it looks good then, and I can have it, I should be able to have it. Um, sex is, 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 is so easy now and available, then it must be for me. And then some of us in this moment are probably maybe cringing saying, I cannot believe that we're actually talking about this subject from the stage. See, the enemy brings confusion to both sides. He doesn't care how he confuses us when it comes to God's design, as long as he can confuse us. So he'll confuse us and make you think, hey, you can do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it, how you want to do it, whenever you want to do it. And he'll also bring confusion to a topic that where we don't have knowledge and wisdom because we don't discuss it because it's sensitive. He doesn't care what method he uses to implement his mission. And John 10, 10 shows us his mission. His mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. And he has been using this topic to kill, steal, and destroy mankind for, since the beginning. And if they struggled with it 6,000 years ago, how much more do we struggle with it today? But God wants to come in the confusion and bring clarity. And when we understand God's standpoint of the action and Jesus speaking to the heart, and we can truly be palms up and receive that this genuinely affects all of us, then we can begin to understand more of clearly why God has called this to be a commandment. And so when we're looking at it, I want to look at three different ways that God calls us to be a commandment. But through this whole thread of teaching the commandments, one of the things we've talked about are guardrails. Pastor Jeremy uses an illustration of the guardrail going around a mountain in Colorado and, and, and how, we, how we love those guardrails that keep us off of going off the end of the mountain. I've been to Colorado one time in my life, okay? And um, I took a two-wheel drive car up a snowy mountain that said, do not take a two-wheel drive car up the snowy mountain. And I ended up in the ditch, buried in the snow, and I had to back down the mountain. All along, my wife sitting there saying, I told you, I told you. And I said, I'm from East Texas. I can drive anywhere I want to. Little did I know that is not true. So when we look at East Texas, what are some guardrails that like really um, translate to us? So uh, you're going over like a big body of water like Sam Raven or Toledo Bend, or let's take the, the, the mighty Trinity River. All right? We love those guardrails. We don't fight those guardrails. We actually embrace those guardrails, and we're glad that someone um, put those guardrails in while 10 other people watched them do it. Y'all might get that joke in a little bit. <laughs> if you've ever been on the Trinity River fishing, all right, I will say this. There are things that have come out of that water that can swallow me whole. And if you ever see a refrigerator floating down the Trinity River taped up, you probably do not want to know what contents are inside of that refrigerator. That is a scary, scary body of water. And um, we love the fact that the guardrails keep us from driving our vehicle off into the abyss. 
yet we fight the guardrails that God has put on our life. And those guardrails are exactly the same thing to keep us from running our life off into the abyss and being swallowed up by something bigger than us. And so as we unpack why God calls us a commandment and our solution, I just want you to hold that close to your heart. So number one on your fill in the blanks when we're looking at why God calls this a commandment is when we commit adultery, we break all 10 commandments at the same time. I'm gonna say that one more time. When we commit adultery, we break all 10 commandments at the same time. And in the realities of that statement, when God showed me this, like I'm gonna be honest with you, there was like, there was a little bit of heartbreak and the heartbreak wasn't from fear. It was just to see how the enemy has used the power of sin to bring so much destruction in all of these areas. And when God shows us, because when we commit adultery, it's a sin against ourself, it's a sin against our body and against God. And in this moment, we simultaneously break all 10 commandments and I wanna walk through and show you how we do that. So number one, no other God. When we commit adultery, we choose to be God over our body and someone else's. When we make a decision outside of God's design and we invite someone else into that decision, we become God. We say, God, I can do what I want to with my body how I want to do it. We've all heard, well, it's my body. What difference does it make? Actually, our body as believers belong to Christ. And so when we make that decision for ourselves and someone else, we choose to be God over our body. Number two, no idols. When we commit adultery, our desires become, our, become an idol and the desires of actually the other person's body. The, the desire of the thought, the, 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 the imagery of what could be, like the desire of what someone's body could feel like or look like, like, and I know that's graphic, but that's the truth. And in that moment, we begin to worship the things, we begin to worship the things in our mind and actually begin to worship something that does not belong to us. And anytime we worship something outside of Jesus, it is an idol in our life. Jesus is the only one that has done the necessary things and it reserves the right to have our worship. Nothing else in our life reserves a right for our worship. And if we allow it to take that place, it becomes an idol in our life. Number three, we don't take God's name in vain. When we commit adultery, we bring shame to the Holy Spirit and God's name. In Corinthians, and we're gonna look at this in a little bit, Paul's talking about how our body is one with Christ, that our body belongs to God because of the price that he paid. Well, listen, guys, when, when we commit adultery, all right, when we operate outside of God's sexual de design, we invite the Holy Spirit. He's with us. He is in us. We bring God into the Holy Spirit, into the good and bad things of our life. So we bring shame to the Holy Spirit in God's name. Number four, keep the Sabbath holy. When we commit adultery, we rob our soul and mind of rest. Sin, sin alone robs our soul and our mind of rest of rest. The enemy is so good at painting a picture over here saying, boy, it looks good. It feels good. It's got to be good. All in an effort for us to indulge in this all so that we feel shame and guilt. So he operates on both sides of the road. So he'll, he'll present something to you that looks a certain way. All in order for us to operate in shame and guilt, and that robs our soul and our mind of rest. Number five, honor your mom and dad. When we commit adultery, we dishonor mom and dad through our motives and our actions. Um, my dad was in the second service, and, and, and I was sitting there thinking through, like, all the, the good and the bad in my life either bring honor or dishonor to my dad. And I have three daughters, and my three daughters in their actions, good and bad, bring honor or dishonor to me and their mother. And so when we look at that, some of us may say, yeah, but you don't understand, like, 
how my parents are. You don't understand what I went through. It's not about your parents. It's about you. It's about what you do. It's about who you are. Like we have the opportunity and the responsibility uh, that, that, that in our personal life that we can, we can hand down as parents, we can hand down to our kids what honor looks like, but we can also hand down what dishonor looks like. And we have a responsibility, but not only a responsibility, an opportunity, right? Uh, to stop something generational from handing down to our kids. And the way we honor our mother and father is we're gonna hand down to our children. And what an opportunity for us to hand down to our children and our children's children what it really looks like to honor mom and dad. Number six, we don't murder. When we commit adultery, we kill relationships, holiness, and sanctification. And that word sanctification means to be set apart. Like God set apart his sexual design in marriage for us. And when we step outside of those guardrails, we truly rob and steal and kill relationships, holiness, and sanctification. I'd be willing to bet that everybody in here can think of an incident either in your own life or in someone close to you where this has brought destruction upon a relationship. Again, the enemy has been using this and weaponizing this tool for 6,000 years. And it is at a rampant pace, higher than ever, destroying our families, destroying relationships, having parent, kids be raised by single moms and single dads, and that was not God's design. And the enemy loves that he can use this to attack the foundation of the family. Number seven, do not commit adultery. We're talking about that today. Uh, but I want to pause here just for a second. I want to look at what Paul's talking about in Corinthians. He's talking to the church of Corinthians here in this 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 20. The, the, the scriptures are going to be on the screen. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but what Paul's really, what, what's going on is, is the Corinthians are like, um, they're going to like the Waffle House to have dinner, Right? Who doesn't love the Waffle House? Amazing waffles. I don't know what's in them. I don't know who's cooking them. And I don't care. They are delicious. But they're going to the Waffle House, right? And Paul said, hey, that's good. He says, your body was made for food and food for your body. The problem is, is they're leaving the Waffle House. And they're crossing the road and they're going over to Wendy's brothel or Wendy's house of prostitutes for dessert. And Paul said, you... No, that, that, that's, that's the problem. And the enemy has been confusing, confusing that line, that road between what is good and what's not. And so this is what the scripture says. In verse 12, it says, you say I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And I am allowed to do anything, but I must not become a slave to anything. Yes, we have the right through free will, to do whatever we want to do. God give us free will to make a decision. And so you can do whatever you want to do just because you can do whatever you want to do does not make all decisions good. Because if you do the things that are outside of God's design, what happens is, is you become a slave to it. And when we're a slave to anything that pulls us out of God's design, we're enslaved to destruction. We're enslaved to, to, to death. And Paul is telling him, he says, go eat at the Waffle House. But you cannot cross the road because, yeah, you can make that decision. But that enslaves you to something that is going to destroy your life. He goes on in verse 15. He says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. He said, this is not God's design. And he goes on at 18, he says, so run from this. Run from sexual sin. If Paul is telling the church of Corinthians and the city of Corinth to run from sexual sin then, how much more do we need to run from it now? He says, there is no other sin that clearly affects the body as this one. For sexual immorality is a sin against our own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? For God bought you with a high price. 
a price that none of us could pay, a price that none of us were willing to pray to, to pay. And God spent his greatest resource upon us because we couldn't. And because he prayed that pay the highest price possible, he deserves our honor through all means of our life, including our body. Number eight, do not steal. When we commit adultery, we rob something from someone that does not belong to us. Number nine, do not lie. When we commit adultery, we lie to ourselves and others about true value and love. God has a design for true value and love. But at this campus and all campuses, I'd be willing to bet that majority of us was taught the wrong way about love and value. I know I was. And so the way I was taught what real love is and value is, is that's actually the way I begin to receive. So I thought this is how you receive love. Right? And, and, and I thought that because I receive it like this, this is how I'm supposed to give love. And I had a broken perspective of what real love and value is. And what happened is, is I would try to communicate and receive love the wrong way, and it would leave me empty, and I did it over and over again, not knowing what true love was until I met Jesus, until I experienced the love and the grace, the compassion and the kindness and the forgiveness and the gentleness of Jesus. And it's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I'm a dad. It's not because I'm a husband. It's not because I'm anything but his son. And when I begin to understand that as his son, he is my dad, and I begin to understand what, what grace is and what mercy is, because when I look back behind me, of all the good and all the bad, I can see Jesus woven in my story. I can see him in every intersection of my life. And, he, and I see what value is with the patience and the kindness of God when I didn't deserve it. And when I begin to understand what true love and true value is, it began to help me understand how to receive it, actually how to fight for my own value when I discover my value in Christ, a healthy value, not a conceited value, but also how to begin to love in a way that was honoring to God. And it's actually been one of the most healing things that I've experienced. And so we lie to people about what real love and real value is because, listen, sex is not real love. You do not find value in sex. I, you, if, if you're, the value of your marriage is hinged on sex, you're missing it. The value of your marriage has to be hinged on Jesus and Jesus alone. The sex part is it's God's design, but if your value rests in that, especially outside of his design, you will be left empty. Number 10, do not covet or desire. When we commit adultery, we covet or desire what does not belong to us. The 10th commandment actually says, do not covet, covet your neighbor's wife. The second reason God has put guardrails on sex is God designed sex to be fulfilled and enjoyed inside the confides of marriage between a man and a woman. It's designed to be fulfilled and enjoyed inside the confines of marriage. If marriage is our guardrails and our parameters for sex, there's also some responsibility inside those guardrails. Like um, God has designed sex for marriage, but he's also, he designed it to be healthy. And if we're using sex and weaponizing it to hurt or um, to sway like, that's not God's design. God's design is for it to be a, a true form of intimacy, a true form of connection. I, but even if the design of sex isn't whole in your marriage, it doesn't give us the right to step outside of God's design. Because the enemy will even use that to justify, well, I mean, I'm not, it's not happening here, so I'll go over here. I'll jump across this fence. And really what God's calling us to do is stay within the parameters and what he designed and work on the relationship and what God has 
called us to. Look at it like a, like a, like, like a fire. Like we get what, in East Texas, where we get like two weeks of winter? And in those two weeks, every one of you in this room, everyone listening, everyone in NAC, have set around a fire, around a fire pit or in a fire in a house. We love the power. We love the warmth. We love the way it looks. We love the way it feels. But we also love the security that the fact that it's inside parameters and it's contained. And that's the way sex is designed in the marriage. But when that fire gets outside of its containment, it turns into a wildfire. And look at, look at New Mexico. Look at the panhandle. Look at the wildfires that we have faced. And a wildfire consumes and destroys everything it touches. It feeds off itself. It gets energy from itself. And it's very, very difficult to contain that wildfire. It's, it's very difficult to get it to stop. And when we operate outside of God's design, in sex and in every area, it becomes a wildfire in our life and it consumes and destroys everything that it touches. The third reason God has put guardrails on sex is because adultery produces an internal pain and soul guilt. It brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit. And listen, guys, God has not designed us to wear guilt or sorrow. That's not our design. If you're sitting in here and you're hearing this message today and like you're, you feel guilt and sorrow for what has happened, that is not God. That is the enemy. The enemy will put guilt and sorrow on you like a garment. And once that garment is upon you, it is, it is a very heavy burden. I know I wore that garment for a long time. And until I understood what access I had to Jesus and what Jesus truly done for me and, 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 and of my forgiveness and the covering of, of, of my life and, and what Jesus did on the cross, it was, I began to peel that shame and that guilt off and what it was was the goodness of God leading me to it. The enemy would love for us to stay in guilt and shame. I ask this in any counseling session that I do. If they're struggling with what's behind them, pastor, you just don't know what I've done. I hear that all the time. You don't understand all the bad I've done. You don't understand how do I undo that. And I ask them this question. I ask them all the time, hey, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? And the majority of them tell me they had Chick-fil-A. And I ask them this simple question. Can you go uneat that spicy chicken biscuit? No, you can't. You cannot uneat it. But you can determine what you have for breakfast tomorrow. You, you can make that decision. If you want another spicy chicken biscuit, go get it. If you want a waffle from the Waffle House, you can go get it. But what it's showing us is you cannot undo your past. You can't undo your past. It's, it's impossible to undo the things of our past. Give me that break, Brandon. But when I look at my past, because of a scripture in Psalms, and it says that God is behind me, it says he's with me, and he says he's in front of me. And I can't undo what I've done yesterday. But God gives me a way, in Ephesians, he says, I am a new creation. I am a new creation daily. And I get to make the decision to begin to pursue a life of righteousness in Christ. And so look at your past, look at everything like a brick, and this is what the enemy will do. He'll take that brick, and he'll throw it through your front door, and he does not care what it looks like, what it's wrapped in, what it sounds like, as long as it's destruction. He'll throw the brick of shame, he'll throw the brick of guilt, he'll throw the brick of adultery, he'll throw the brick of murder, the brick, he doesn't care what that brick is. As long as it destroys something in your life. But here's the beauty of it. The same exact brick, the same brick of guilt, the same brick of shame, the same brick of your mistakes, God will use that same brick to build a foundation, something strong to stand on. When I look at my past, it's, what's, it's a story of Jesus, not me. It's a story of his redemptive blood. It's a story of his goodness and his grace, not me. 
And he has used it to build a foundation that has saved my marriage, it has saved my life, it has saved my family, and he wants to do the same for you today. Does that excite anyone this morning? Amen. The same brick the enemy wants to destroy your life with is the same brick God says, if you'll let me have it, I'll build your testimony so that you can reach and help someone else that's in your community, that's in your world. You will reach and talk to people that I will never reach and talk to. And God wants to use your past and he wants to use your struggles and he wants to use your victories. He wants to use all of you for a story that points to him. My story points to God. If it ever points to me, it is derailed. But when it points to Christ, it shows his goodness and it gives someone hope, I hope. And your life can do the same. And that's what Jesus wants to do today. And so I want to look at how do we do this? Because committing adultery is a problem that has affected us all in some way. And I told you there was a solution, right? There is a solution. But this is what I can promise you. You are not the solution, and neither am I. I'm not the solution to my marriage. I'm not the solution to my kids. I'm definitely not the solution to your marriage and your kids. You are not the solution. Am I a factor? Absolutely. And I'm going to give you a Sunday school answer, but it is the only answer and the only solution to the conditions of the heart of man and the attack of the enemy is Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other solution. The enemy has made us think that there is other solutions and there's other ways and they're not. They all pull us away from the only solution that there is. We're going to go back to Matthew where Jesus is on the Sermon of the Mount, right? And we're going to, here's the solution. Matthew 5, 29 and 30 says this. So if your eye, even your good one, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Listen, out in the lobby, we do not have an eye gouging station and a hand cutting off station set up. Nobody is losing body parts today because I can cut your hand off and gouge your eye out. That is not the solution. That's not what Jesus is saying. But the solution is within the text. And he's showing us two things. First thing he's showing us is he's saying, whatever is keeping you from me, not me, from God, whatever is keeping you out of my presence, cut it off and gouge it out because it's not worth it, guys. And he is saying, like, it would be better for you to lose part of your body and be with me in heaven than to continue to keep your whole body and reject my authority in this and miss it. And that's what he's saying here. He said, I love you enough that I'd... I'd rather you lose part of your physical body and be with me for eternity than to continuously reject my authority. And my authority is set in place because I love you so much. How do we do this? How do we tear out and cut off the things that are keeping us from God? Matthew 6 and 33, he says this. My favorite scripture in the Bible. I think it applies to every area of our life. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything, everything you need. Some of you in here have heard that scripture. Some of you may have not. Um, this is the, the simplicity of it. Put me first in everything you do. I'll take care of the rest. That's the simplicity of that scripture. Well, how do we do that? It's not you just wake up and all of a sudden you're throwing, you're putting God in first because remember, this is a pursuit. All right, Matthew 7, 7 shows us the pursuit. He says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open. Jesus is saying, if you will keep on seeking me, if you will keep on asking for things of me, I'll show up. But, but you just, we want to do it once and move on. He's saying, you got to keep on. But here's the thing. If you keep on seeking the wrong thing, if you keep on asking for the wrong thing, the enemy will give you all of it you want why it's so powerful to understand that God's will and God's law and God's ways are meant to, for life abundantly, not to kill, steal, and destroy us. C.S. Lewis says it like this, active habits are strengthened by repetition, 
but passive ones are weakened. All of us have habits. If you have the habit of lifting weights, you will get stronger. If you have the habit of running a lot, you'll be able to run further, further, farther. Right? If you have the habit of pursuing Jesus, you will experience Jesus. But if you have the habit of being king of your life, you will get to be king of your life. We all have habits, and God's saying, make me one of them. Make me the first one. Where you seek me and you'll find me. If you ask, I'll give it. And if you keep on knocking, I'll open. So in response to this, I want to give you three ways to respond. Three ways to respond to the message. Number one, number one's confession. And I know that word can kind of be scary. Like, we're not asking nobody to get on stage and tell everybody what you've done, standing up where you're at, telling everybody what you've done, because that, is, that, 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 that does no good. James 5 and 16 says, confess your sins to one another and you will find healing. First of all, you've got to bring it to God. And the idea of confessing to God the, our struggles and sin of our life scares us. But listen, guys, he already knows. You're not going to surprise him. He knows. He's just waiting to meet you there with grace and kindness and goodness, but with direction, with instruction. And the second one is, like, my person's my dad. Like, I, I, my dad knows everything there is to know about me. And I bring these things to my dad, number one, because I trust him. But secondly, it's because his instruction, although very stern at times, is done out of love. And if you don't have a person, like, we can help you with that. You see, we go to God for forgiveness and one another for healing. And I want to speak to this for a second, not not because I'm the campus pastor, not because of a position, because I am you. And this is what I mean. So many of us come on a Sunday morning, get an hour and a half, well, if Pastor Jeremy's preaching, two hours. <laughs> and then that's all we get for the week. And we wonder, we wonder why our life is in rubbles at times. We'll come by and get a two-hour fill of a quarter of a tank and wonder why we can't hear from God. And some of us come by, we get two-hour fill of the tank on a Sunday morning service and walk out the door and the enemy allows us to live in comfort and success and we think that we're okay. And he's not worried about you coming to church on a Sunday and filling a seat. I filled a seat for 35 years and did nothing for the kingdom. He's okay with you. Because if he can make you think, well, you've got enough to get going. You just hang on to the good things in your life. You don't need Jesus. You've got enough. He will keep you there because you're not making tracks for the kingdom of God. And I tell you this because I love you. Because seven years ago, I stood at an intersection in my life and I had lost everything. My family, almost my job, almost my life, I had lost everything. And in that moment of that intersection, I made a decision to turn and look at God and says, I can't be king no more. I need you to sit on the throne of my life. And in that moment, Jesus, with the, the, with the outstretched hand of kindness, pulled me back in. And I said, God, I'll do anything you ask me to do. And the next thing he did was he walked me through the doors of this church. I went through starting point, got involved in groups, served on a dream team, went through encounter, did all of those things. And here's the thing, listen, Timber Creek is not the solution either. Starting point is not the solution. Groups, not the solution. Dream teams, not the solution. Encounter, whatever class you're part of, not the solution. They're not because they're not God. And so if you're just serving on a team to serve on a team, you're serving for the wrong reason. They weren't the solution, but they were a resource. 
and God's way of connecting me to the body of Christ, which healed me. Like getting involved in a team, getting involved in groups, and actually using it and applying to my life, pointing me to the greatest source man will ever know. It is a relationship with Jesus. It is freedom with Jesus. It is grace in Jesus. And so this, the, 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 the Timber Creek as a resource and a tool was because God got me connected to Christian community. You see, if you study Jesus, everything he did was in community. The enemy is robbing so many of us. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter where you're at in your life. God wants us to be in godly community. And if that's all you're getting is two hours a week, the enemy is robbing you of one of the greatest gifts God has for his children. We don't need you to serve more than you need it. And it's not about serving. It is about the unity and the community and the relational equity because I can look across this room right now and see people that I met then and that, I, that, that I'm meeting now that are part of the healing agents in my life. And it doesn't matter if you go to this church or another church. Whatever church you go to, if it's Timber Creek, great. If it's another church down the road, get connected to the body of Christ because you're, you need it. Get desperate for God's people. Get desperate for God. In your seat back pocket or in the chairs, I'm, we're going we're gonna to do this. There's a connect card there. And if you're hearing this message and you're saying, man, that's me. That's me right there. I, I have come here. I've landed on a Sunday morning here and there. And I just, my life isn't, there's just something missing. You don't have to know what's missing. But you know that you're ready for more and you want more of Jesus. I just encourage you to fill your information out. And on the bottom, just write, I'm ready. Just write, I'm ready. And these are the two promises I want to make you. I promise you, as a team at all locations, we will pray over your card. And the second promise I'm going to make you is we're going to give you a phone call. And we're going to help you take your next step. You don't have to figure out what your next step is right now. We can help you with that. We want to help you take your next step to experiencing all God has for you, to experiencing freedom and the grace and the promise and the hope that God has for each and every one of us in this room and in all locations today. We go to God for forgiveness, but to one another for healing. The second thing is, the second response is repentance. Guys, our lives must change. If it's not in this area, I promise all of us need to change some areas in our life. Our habits must change, our patterns must change. How? Paul shows us in Romans 2 and 4, he says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness? his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It was the goodness of God that reached down to me seven years ago and picked me up. It wasn't a lightning bolt. It wasn't his judgment. It wasn't guilt. It wasn't shame. It was his goodness. And some of you in here today need to reach down and grab a hold of the hand of God's goodness and let him begin to change your life and the direction of your life. And the third thing is, guys, is grace. You gotta give it and receive it. This is an area that I have actually struggled in in my past. I've been better at giving it than receiving it. And it's something that I know God's still working on me. But man, the more I understand the goodness and kindness of God, and I can sit in His grace, it is teaching me to have more grace for people that I have hurt and people that have hurt me in my life. And there's so much freedom in it. And I know we've discussed a lot today. But I also know that God wants to do a work in this moment. So if you will, everybody, go ahead and bow your heads. If in this message, God has spoke something to you, and you want to receive Jesus for the first time, and you say, you know what my next step is? I just, I need to trust God with my life. For the first time, or, if, or, or, or for a fresh time, if you need a reviving, a resetting of a relationship with Jesus, I just ask, as all heads are bowed, I just ask that you raise your hand this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hands all over the room. Thank you, Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord, God, thank you for, thank you for showing up today as you always do. And God, I just pray that what you have put inside of us today through your word, God, that the enemy doesn't rob it. And God, I just pray that we 
continue to pursue a life of righteousness, righteousness through you. God, I pray your kindness, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness over everyone in here. And God, if anyone is sitting here and pride and shame and guilt is, is blocking them from responding, God, to, to your kindness, God, I just pray that you eliminate that pride and that shame and that guilt in this morning, Lord. That your people respond to your word and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.